Welcome Meatsmiths. You're listening to a Meatsmith Harvest. Restoring husbandry to prosperity. By means of the traditions of our fathers. This Farmstead Meatsmith production is made possible by you. If you like it, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating at a level you'd enjoy giving at. Your gift helps us increase the quality and quantity of all our free media education. Thank you, and happy harvesting. Hello, Meatsmiths. Welcome to another episode of A Meatsmith Harvest. We are recording on August 12th, Feast of St. Clair, and it's actually nice to be sitting next to you so closely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't done this in a while. No, I know. Just, uh, it's nice mm-hmm. to sit and chat. Yeah. So um, thank you, Meatsmiths, for tuning in and listening to our conversation today. It's been a conversation we've wanted to have for months and we've like let out little trickles of our thoughts in other places like the Brian Holdsworth interview. Some of it came out and hmm. a little bit with our interview with Ross McKnight. But this is where we're going to lay it all out. Okay. <laughs> a little bit more systematically, okay. I think. I didn't know I had been preparing for this for the past several months. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, things that you let me know, and then I like store them okay. in my little way. Good. So I'll, I'll um, pull it out of you. But. Good. At least one of us knows what's going on. <laughs> um, but before we do, all the housekeeping is that we actually have a, a, quite a bit to promote before we do, and um, I'll try to do it as quick as possible. So here we go. The Yay, first... all the housekeeping. Yeah. That's like our thing is housekeeping. It, you're right. It's the domestic economy. Right. Okay, so it doesn't have to be whole home. It's not negative. Okay. No. <laughs> it's this true. This is what we do. Householding, housekeeping. Yeah. That's true. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the first thing is the goose class. Yes. This is the biggest deal. Mm-hmm. Because we were wanting to do this over a year ago, but then we moved. Right. So it kind of went on side, yeah. back burner, way back burner. That can change things. Moving can. But actually, I'm surprised it's only been a year, and we're in a position to hold this kind of a class. Yeah. So you didn't have to build the goose fattening house. It's already there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's going to be on November... Oh, boy. The 10th act- and 11th. There we go. November 10th and 11th. 11th is the Feast of St. Martin of Tours. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. all on our website. Um, and it's the inaugural class. We're going to go over the husbandry, the dispatching the cookery the well i'll let you do all that but what's what's going to happen it's going to be like uh all the other meatsmith classes that we do which is fearlessly and boldly put knives in everyone's hands <laughs> and have them do everything uh-huh. so it's really going to be another hands-on thing i'm raising i think i have 19 geese right now and for the class we're going to slaughter at least eight of them uh, the class again will be capped at eight, which is also a thing that we do commonly, which maintains the high concentration of physical education that each person gets rather than diluting it. So no meatsmith class is a, is billed as a hands-on class and then accidentally becomes a demonstrational class. <laughs> That's true. Which is a thing that happens mm, a lot. I we see. don't do that. Like mm. it's, we cap it at eight and if you come, you will kill a goose. And you will pluck a goose. You will defeather it artfully and beautifully and efficiency, which if you've ever plucked waterfowl, you know that is, that's quite a claim is to do that efficiently. Yeah. Um, and then we'll eviscerate the geese. We will part out their carcasses and we will make confit. And we will make so many things. We will make a liver mousse pate and we will just derive our sustenance for the Duration of two days, it's a two-day class, from the geese that we harvest and feast upon them at the end of each of the two days. Mm-hmm. And it's really, the goose is that animal that kind of disappeared from the grocery store. It disappeared from our diet with the um, advance and the ubiquitous conquering of the industrialized food supply. 
the goose just kind of vanished. You can get it, you know, at some places. Uh, so it hasn't really mm -hmm. suffered what a lot of the other uh, livestock have suffered from the industrial model. It is still very much ordered, tailored, perfectly suited to the backyard, the backyard scale of agriculture, mm -hmm. the domestic scale. So, and so all of the old recipes of confit, even of fattened goose liver, of we're going to make even, um, we're going to stuff sausage into the neck skin of the goose. We're going to roast the goose. We're going to stuff the goose. There's going to be lots of stuffing going on. <laughs> um, all of these things, they're, they're all rooted in the, the joyous peasant kitchen. Um, the goose was distinctly a festive bird, a feasting bird, because unlike chickens, unlike rabbits, unlike a lot of other small livestock, they kind of take a while to grow out. So it's kind of a big deal, usually just a once a year deal when you would harvest your barnyard goose and uh, dutifully fatten its liver with acorns and chestnuts and corn to be served at the Réveillon of Christmas, mm. the big Christmas feast. So it's a goose is by nature a festive bird and by nature a very noble bird. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in, I, once again, endemic to all peasant economy, extremely thrifty. Yeah. I know I'm just rambling about geese now, but they are, <clears throat> no. if you have grass, you can raise geese. Mm -hmm. They graze like cattle. They're amazing and they're incredibly hardy and they don't get sick and stuff. They may get eaten <laughs> by other bad animals, yeah. but they don't get sick. They're, yeah. they're incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. And so they're just, I, I say that they are the, um, the pig of the bird world because their primary right. yield, like the pig, is fat yeah. and it's a very unique and special fat. So that's, I mean, that's going to be the class. It'll be two days yeah. and it'll, it'll be everything. The kill, the cutting, the curing, the cooking. Yeah. And I would add to that, that if you've been to a pig class, this is still very much, it would be a valuable resource to you because there's some things that we're going to cover that we talked about maybe in the pig class, but we didn't do. It's is a little bit more cookery, a little bit more kitchen, Finesse, um, we're going to do bone broth and um, roasting the animal mm -hmm. and a couple other things I can't remember. But yeah. it's a little bit more tailored to just the cookery in the in the household. Yeah, because one thing we aren't, just by virtue of time, I mean, we could keep you all for a week for the family pig, but right. um, we run out of time to cover the third primary way This is yeah of preserving the flesh of your animals. Yes. In the uh, family pig, we cover uh, the dry salting. And we even talk about fermenting because we make fresh sausage, which is basically just the beginning of preserved sausage, otherwise known as salami. Mm -hmm. But we, we just don't have the time to get into riettes or confit. Right. And confit and riette and real are, those are preserving meat in fat. That's what that is. It's the preservation of meat that you have lightly cured and then cooked in fat and then stored, completely submerged in lard, in the larder, in a crock or something, mm -hmm. or a large jar mm -hmm. in a cool place for many months where like all traditional peasant cures, it not only keeps, but it ripens and it gets better and better with flavor, with, uh, with time. Mm -hmm. So we're going it, to, it's not just, we're going to make, you know, goose cone fee. We're going to cover cone fee. And what, once you know, right. once you do it, once you make cone fee from a goose, which it is just so uniquely and perfectly suited to, um, then you have that in your armory. Mm -hmm. Then you have that in your kitchen, the ability mm -hmm. to cone fee things again, not just for flavoring, but for preservation, yeah. which is actually where the flavor comes from. Okay. They are the same. Awesome. Um, so confit we'll yeah. definitely cover. Yeah. So we're going to do that this November. Um, it's, uh, we just posted it in the beginning of August. So hopefully um, <clears throat> that gives you enough time to make plans. And, and, and it will also prepare you for some excellent things that you can make for the holidays. Oh, it's yeah. sort of the timing is also perfect too. It is. The goose is, you look at any tradition, it's always harvested in Martinmas, um, or at least when it is a refrigerator outside. And that's because you need its cone feed flesh 
to make your hearty baked bean stew, mm. otherwise known as cassoulet mm -hmm. in the in the French speaking places, and it is um, sort of like because you also need pig skin for your mm -hmm. cassoulet, but it is the essence of a hearty winter fare that keeps you warm from the inside out during the cold <laughs> months. It's just beans, quarts of fat of both pig and <laughs> goose, and lots of meat in beans. So basically, it's fat served with protein with a side of protein and some more fat. That's what cassoulet is. <laughs> and maybe some fried bread. And you got to yeah. eat it like you'll read accounts of cassoulet because it's a peasant dish. It uh -huh. is peasant food. Um, of course, they will make, you know, little tiny cylinders of it in very nice restaurants and argue about what goes in it. Uh -huh. But really, it is a baked bean stew in which go all of the things, indispensably confit of some kind, mm -hmm. the skin of a pig of some kind. And sometimes they even put lamb in it, mm. you know, <clears throat> and they make a crispy crust with stale breadcrumbs. That's it's right. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you read all the counts of it and you need, uh, like they're, they're serious about this. You need, you can't eat it for dinner. Oh. You can't eat cassoulet for, for dinner before oh. bed Oh. because you need at least five hours to digest it. <laughs> So it's a midday meal. Okay, yes. It's a supper. Yes. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, that's that's so exciting. It's it's our first time doing it. So we hope that it goes over well. And if it does, then yeah. um, we'll just keep doing it, you know, every mm. year. Yeah, and I think it's great, too, for people who don't raise geese now. Mm. Um Because you all should. And the best <laughs> way to get started on geese is to uh, get the ending on geese yeah. sorted out. That's Figure true. out how to kill them because the best thing you can do for any domestic livestock situation is learn how to cull. Mm -hmm. That's how you manage. Mm -hmm. And geese in particular, they are one of those creatures mm -hmm. that becomes a burden on the farm because for a couple of reasons, they are touted for their health, for the fact that they eat grass. And they're sort of sold as guard animals, which, you know, maybe against some very timid predators, a <laughs> guard goose will work. We're talking tiny, timid predators. So and certain like species. Smaller than raccoons, for yeah. example. <laughs> <laughs> like a rat. <laughs> yeah, might scare away some rats. Um, yeah. So it, it, in general, though, they are put forth as this great homesteading animal because they are. Mm -hmm. And so... In my work, traveling from farm to farm, slaughtering animals, all on small homesteads, I routinely see one, two, it's usually an odd number, actually, three, or because, <laughs> you know, they die off, and um, like seven-year-old geese or five-year-old oh. geese, because they, mm -hmm. they got them, but then just didn't go to the slaughter, and I get it. Mm -hmm. I get why you didn't. It's a big, noisy, intimidating bird, and you know that plucking waterfowl is a major pain, mm -hmm. and... It's just more trouble than it's worth because you do not have the final cause on your taste buds. Like mm -hmm. you don't understand what you're missing out on. Mm -hmm. If you don't eat goose, then it's hard to know why you should mm -hmm. kill them and eat them. Mm -hmm. Because the once you taste a goose, once you taste and see what it does to the economy of your kitchen, especially their fat, uh, then you won't be able to stop killing geese <laughs> raising and killing geese it's they are so good they're so useful uh -huh. so if if you have sort of wisely held off from getting geese because you don't have the ends sorted this class is to help you get the ends yeah. the final cause it's an apology but, for it yes the t loss of the goose mm -hmm. awesome cool well we hope we see you there um real quick the oh we need to promote the school of traditional skills which you can find at schooloftraditionalskills.com, which is run by our new friends, um, <clears throat> Josh, Josh and, Carolyn and Carolyn Thomas. Thomas. Mm -hmm. They run Homesteading Family YouTube channel. They've got some amazing content. And they are, this is like the next, I don't know what you call it, but it's it's a separate. They've really designed and launched a big school, yeah. a big online Academy. Yeah, and they, they pulled together about a dozen people who teach already, and they created the 
platform mm. for all of these uh, teachers to teach what they do best. Mm -hmm. So, and we're we're really blessed to be a part of that. So, Brandon spent some time making videos, but I think the summit, yes, the summit is a free event that yeah. you're going to be a part of. It's kind of like a webinar. It's all online. Mm -hmm. um, and all you got to do is go to that website and um, schooloftraditionalskills.com and type in your email address. We're going to put the link below these show notes and hit that link. Uh, we'll put it like right at the top. So can't miss it. Go to that link, enter your email uh, address, and then you can be a part of the Skills Summit. Oh boy, the dates are escaping me, but it's in... <laughs> I didn't I write my... it down. Oh, it's, I, I did. It's um, right here. I think... It's uh, a four-day event, yeah, and Brandon's at the... The last day, four I day online summit, September twelfth through the fifteenth. Yeah. So starting on the most holy yeah. name of Mary. But some of the ending on the seven sorrows. Oh wow, that's pretty neat. You get to learn the <laughs> traditional skills of uh, Nazareth, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's going to come up later, actually. Okay. Okay. So um, anyway, we got to got to mention that because it's going to be a really fantastic online event. The best maybe in the in the in the whole year I think that's being offered so and then there's some conferences you're going to be a part of Right. One is right around the corner. If oh, you're yeah. in the Midwest, there is something called the Ozark Homesteading, Homesteading Expo. Expo. There you go. We did it together. <laughs> okay. It's August 20... Well, it's two days, but you're going to be there August 27th. Right. And you, so you could type in Ozark Homesteading Expo, and it's the first thing that pops up. And... Um, it's it's gonna be a great event. I think it's in Missouri. Yes, it is. It's in Missouri. Sent mid, smack middle of the country. Yeah. And uh, I know I'm gonna be on the 26th. You are? Yeah. I got it wrong. Okay. I'm it's... gonna be on Friday, the 26th. Okay. Of this month, which is the month of August. Yeah, and in two weeks. So yeah. actually, when hopefully this will get this out to you all soon. <laughs> well, <laughs> before yeah. Before then, the idea. Oh, right, the podcast. Yeah. yeah, we're kind of slow at turning it around. Yeah. But that's that's neither here nor there. Anyway, it's a two day event. I think we can get this out before yeah. then. But I will be there for one day. That's one right. very long day, and being an expo, like, it's a convention. There's gonna be a lot of people mm -hmm. there. A lot of great farmers from this region, um, doing awesome courses in person and I'll be there on Friday the 26th and it will be a demo but it's we're gonna I'm gonna demo the whole thing I'm gonna drive my slaughter truck up there because it is within driving distance barely and <laughs> I will slaughter a pig mm -hmm. scald and scrape mm -hmm. but, you know with as many people as can watch and we'll be able to talk I'll have a mic on um, we'll be able to demonstrate and answer questions on everything and then that's the first session and then the second session in the afternoon is going to be the cutting and the curing of that pig using traditional peasant methods yep. as is our want. It's so, going to be a wonderful event and yeah. um, it's not going to have a high entrance fee either, I don't think. No. So, um, yeah, if you're in the region, I would try to go. Yeah. Marshfield, mm -hmm. I think is where it it's is. It's a good Marshfield, resource. Marshfield, Missouri. Mm-hmm. Fairgrounds. Um, another similar event, which... Actually, this is more of a two-day event, and it's in, our, in Georgia in early October, the 7th and 8th. Um, White Oak Pastures is hosting you. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more of a private event. Um, well, and, not, it's a public class. Oh, it is? Yeah. There's, is there a cap on the limit? Uh, Probably, the, but it, it can be a lot. We can host. Like, we can have a lot. Okay. Yeah. Like okay. More than eight. <laughs> yeah, gonna be... it's not fully hands-on. It's more of a demo, um, but very mm. extensive. It'll be mm. one pig. Okay. And uh, which is neat. It means that we're not going to be um, uh, weighed down by having to get the processing done. Because we'll just mm -hmm. have one pig. So we can actually really take our time and do more things. Because we're not doing two. Uh -huh. uh, and it'll just be two days. And the cool thing about this is that... Uh, so far, the plan is 
for to use a Iberian pig. So oh. the cool thing about White Oak Pastures is, is they have Iberian hogs. Oh. So the historical porcine unit that is used to make the jamón ibérico in Spain, mm -hmm. they brought those over. And I think that's what we're going to use. So it's going to be the artful and traditional slaughter of a lard pig, a large one. That, you know, more like a mangalitsa than a cooney. Okay. But specifically, like the Iberian hog. It mm -hmm. is an Iberian pig. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're going to, of course, harvest the hog in accord with its physiology and the way it is. Mm -hmm. So we're going to not treat its fat as trim because the fat is the point on these pigs who make lots of solo, lots of traditional cures, including, hopefully, a jamón, which doesn't should not need to be set. That's what you do with an Iberian pig. <laughs> yes. If you don't, you probably <laughs> probably have to go to a confession. <laughs> that's you must. It's an obligation. Yeah. I think it might be a moral obligation <laughs> to make prosciutto from an Iberian pig leg. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So Jamón, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Um that's yeah, and White Oak Pastures is a pretty um it's in pretty Bl robust operation, I would say. Yeah, they got a lot going on. <clears throat> yeah, so this is in Georgia. Yeah, Bluffton, Georgia. Okay, so I would I would look up White Oak Pastures. I think you can find. I think you get tickets on their website. That's right. We've been promoting it on Instagram for a while, so mm -hmm. um, hopefully that might be on your radar if you're in that area. And, then, um, and last thing is, you did actually have an interview with Melissa Norris. Oh yeah. Uh, in July. Right. So we've got that posted on our website um or you can go to the pioneering today podcast on apple podcasts mm -hmm. and it's it's right there so um and i wanted to mention too we've actually worked on our website ourselves um a website page if you scroll to the bottom of our homepage, it says interviews and press and we've got all of our recent interviews there because you've oh, been cool. on a number of nice yeah. nice people's podcasts they're really good interviews so well and we did were you going to mention brian holsworth we mentioned that already okay we can't again that it was, was a, fun it Catholic was a great homesteading good conversation yeah, yeah it's been neat and you know we don't get on that often you and right. i so if you if you want a little more you know we've compiled them all in one place um so we've got our, our youtube channel with some of our conversations your phone but is also We've got our website that has other conversations with other people on it. Yeah. So I've got some alarm going off. Oh, start making dinner. Okay, well, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> and I've got to go start making dinner. <laughs> Let's get it. Okay, that's all of our home housekeeping. Okay, cool. Um, so do you have the Father McNabb book? Right there. We've mentioned this in a couple of places. Mm -hmm. This is the book that has been kind of forming us, kind of nourishing us lately. I'll put it up here for our Facebook. The Church members. and the Land. The Church and the Land. Father Vincent McNabb, prefaced by Dr. William Fahey, right? Mm-hmm, who I got to meet. Yeah. Um, do you want to describe who Father Vincent McNabb is, maybe, or? Well, I can try. He, <laughs> he's a Dominican. Uh, at the beginning of the last century, so you know, contemporary of World War One, and I'm not sure when he died, but he was friends with the likes of Hilaire Belloc, and probably even G.K. Chesterton, and he did. Um, he was sort of instrumental and a leading voice in the original, I think, Catholic Land Movement, mm -hmm. Scotland. If I have that right, yeah, in mm -hmm. Scotland, yes. So mm -hmm. he is, he's he's in Scotland, McNabb, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he's just a very clear thinker. And he, the the cool thing about, well, I guess everyone at that time, is that they were seeing the world change in unprecedented ways, yeah. the likes of which we are still reeling from today, in a big way, and. They were seeing industrialized farming. This was actually right around the time of Weston A. Price also, oh. who was the dentist that was finding why, since we've been eating beignets and baguettes, are our teeth rotting and falling out of our heads? <laughs> but the, 
the people who we have labeled as primitive, who are eating their traditional diets uh, in the bush, have really great teeth, and they like don't even brush. <laughs> and so that that was happening then. That was also kind of when Father Fahey was mm-hmm. around, and he even discovered Weston A. Price mm-hmm. and uh, another um, guy who Weston A. Price people probably would recognize. Um, who talks about this too? Sir Stanton Hicks, who oh. I think is also okay. He was also noticing the the damage done to our diets and to the land inscribed in our dentures in our teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, and I think that Father Vincent McNabb was cool because he he's he's a priest. He's also a Thomist, so he is drawing from the because there's another group of people that were sounding the alarm bell Uh at the turn of the century, you know, from the 1800s to the 1900s with industrialized farming and then factory farming and uh, the unimaginable systematic sort of industrialized murdering that we did of our chothers Mm. in the First World War. And that group that saw this was uh, the pontiffs, the popes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Those people. And they wrote about it mm-hmm. constantly. Yeah. All of them. I know. Pope Pius the Ninth, Pius the Tenth, Leo the Thirteenth, um, Pius the Twelfth, mm-hmm. little Pius the Eleventh, a little later on. Mm-hmm. But they all saw it. And yeah. they were all addressing it. And they were all uh well, I don't know about all, but they were especially Leo the Thirteenth, they were addressing it from the angle of we have departed from a particular philosophy that has precipitated the fracturing of reality. Mm. Meaning we don't know what a thing is. We don't know what its meaning is anymore because we have rebelled against a particular order and philosophy. Mm. And so things are just things. They are disinherited Mm -hmm. from their context, from their um, final cause, from their purpose. And they're just things. And we don't actually know what they are. <laughs> and so people like Father Vincent McNabb, Pope Leo XIII, they were saying we need to actually restore the philosophy we have abandoned. Basically mm-hmm. classical, Thomistic, Catholic philosophy, mm-hmm. which, which was the philosophy for several centuries until we started rebelling it from, with our modern philosophies. Yeah, And when, when you do that, there is you create free agents out of every object. Like they are no longer assigned to a context or an order. Mm. And, um, and so they trace the fragmentation of production, of health, of agriculture to that fragmentation, mm-hmm. to the disjointing of reality itself. Cause it's no longer in a holistic tapestry, mm-hmm. uh, with a hierarchy of purposes and ends anyway. I think we've talked about this before, yeah. maybe a year or two ago. We kind of laid out the four causes yes. of a thing. Anything mm-hmm. you can look at and see if it's a material, efficient, formal, or final cause. Mm-hmm. What what the cause is of um, yeah. like a sausage. You know, materially, it's made up of pork. Um, the idea behind it is the butcher who makes it. The, the recipe, the recipe is, is the formal cause. It would be the formal cause, and then um, the final cause is to feed a family. That's right, to eat it. Yeah. yeah. So the butcher is the efficient cause, right? Or the charcutier. Yeah. 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 And and so we've lost that when it comes to everything. Mm-hmm. We look at everything, and we don't know it. I mean, I'm looking at you right now, and like as a modern, I'm told even. Well, this is what a husband is. Mm -hmm. And it was like when I was growing up, it was not what I now know a husband is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, I I could break it down. I have to think a little bit before I (laughs) speak off the cuff. But there's probably a fourfold cause Mm -hmm. of a husband or a microphone or a a lamp, you know, um, a book even like. Yeah. And I think that it's, it sounds too simple. It sounds uh-huh. like yeah, every child knows that. It's like, yeah, they do. Yeah. We just have to educate it out of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it sounds too simple. Like it almost doesn't need to be said to understand a thing by those causes. Mm-hmm. They're so basic. Mm-hmm. It's so like 
you know, you just get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it almost doesn't need to be said. Like, why even say it? Mm -hmm. But I think when you start to look at the, the ills of our current system, you understand better how essential that basic hylomorphic understanding is when you see what happens when it's removed. Mm -hmm. And you, then you start to see these extravagant, extreme examples mm -hmm. of complete chaos. Mm -hmm. um, of just a thing not being used for its final cause, mm -hmm. right? Or being completely um, uh, perverted in its formation and the way it's created. Isn't this what industrial agriculture is? Mm -hmm. Head in hand bear I, bedecked with base and rosemary. How many people do you know who are building their home culture around seasonal harvest and feasting? Or that are hunting as you are for self sufficiency and back to the land values? Or that share your artist's passion for human scale meat craft? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com, We've created a community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world with these shared goals and two major places for them to learn from and inspire one another. First, we have our semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Heartland Homestead in Oklahoma. Come meet Brandon, get your elbows greasy, and over the course of three days, kill, cut, cure, and cook two pigs completely. You'll rub those greasy elbows with other meatsmiths from around the country, sharing meals and conversations to inspire you for years to come. Secondly, for more remote learning, over at farmsteadmeatsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources five years deep now. And both our on-site classes and online program include access to our most unique and rewarding private community Facebook page, Meatsmith Table, which is the only international network by and for homesteaders harvesting animals on a domestic scale using traditional and regional methods. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeatsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you and support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. I think the most easy, the simplest example that just springs to my mind is corn. Okay. We don't even know what corn is anymore. Right. And if you don't believe me, think of corn relative to how it's acted upon by its four causes. Mm -hmm. And then you see that corn is not even, we don't even know why we're producing corn. We don't know the final cause of it. Mm -hmm. We don't even use it as a food thing. Yeah. So the production of corn... <laughs> Why do we keep making corn? Uh, because we subsidize it. <laughs> like the, it's not even because we need it. Mm -hmm. We produce more corn than we need. Sometimes we have to pay farmers to stop making corn. Um, we produce so much corn that we have to create products to put it in and pervert animal genetics so that they can eat a ton mm -hmm. of tons of it mm -hmm. just to get rid of all this corn that we don't know why we're producing. That, mm -hmm. So there's no final cause tethered to the corn mm -hmm. that is tethering the corn to reality, right. to its nature. Right. And so we, you know, we, we subsidize its production and we have to put it in our gasoline. We have to put it in every processed food on the supermarket shelf. Mm -hmm. Every single one. Corn starch, high fructose corn syrup. You guys know all of that stuff. And then... In the United States, we produced so much of it, we still had some left over. We needed to start fattening cows on it. Not because cows taste great or naturally want to fatten themselves on corn, but because we needed something to do with all the corn. Yeah. So we just fed it to the cows. Yeah. And that's why we have feedlots. Mm -hmm. So it is so divorced from its final cause 
that we don't know why we're producing it. And when it and then it's even untethered from its material cause. Right. We have changed the being, mm-hmm. the material cause of corn. We have modified it on a genetic level. Yeah. It is another thing. We've made it not even corn. I don't even know. So it much to the detriment of our health and you know, I don't have any like statistics or proof of that. I just know it's self evidently obvious. Mm-hmm. Come on. Mm-hmm. I we don't well, we're all sick too. Splicing so. genes, yeah. So we're we have changed the the essence, the substantial form, mm-hmm. so it would seem, of corn, because we have separated it from the way it was acted upon by those four original causes. Very simple, you know. Growing corn to feed people mm-hmm. or to feed livestock that are ordered towards eating it, mm-hmm. but you got to understand those livestock first, right? Because mm-hmm. cows aren't ordered towards mm-hmm. it. Um, they like to graze on mm-hmm. grass. Uh, poultry, on the other hand, they love it. Mm-hmm. They are ordered towards the eating of the corn. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like from a negative perspective, it's easier to see how forsaking these basic four causes just plunges everything into excess, deficiency, fragmentation, and just complete insanity. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love the the title of that book. I don't know if I'd recommend the book, but it's called Stuffed and Starved. We're simultaneously eating way too much of bad things, and we have no nutrients in our bodies. We're just starving ourselves Mm -hmm. with bad things. At the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, and so coming back to like what guys like... um, Guys, guys... Prelates like um, Father Vincent McNabb, mm-hmm. he's a social Priests, critic. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> he saw the Industrial Revolution as trying to just isolate the material cause. Mm-hmm. If we could just there you go. get people to only eat chickens. We were talking about this at the dinner table mm-hmm. the other night. What if we had one farmer create 10,000 chickens Mm -hmm. we could feed the world Mm -hmm. so much so so much more effortlessly Mm -hmm. um but what is lost there are the other causes yeah which are um a man is actually feeding his household right um providing resources for more than just himself Mm -hmm. and then teaching even his children to be able to take on these skills Mm -hmm. and then finally the wholesomeness of a of a, a meal at a table and the formation that children get and the um, ultimately and we'll get here the worship of God with mm-hmm. it like we're cutting things off and in doing so by trying to economize to such an extreme with efficient methods mm-hmm. that now we don't even have. The bottom falls out from under us. We mm. don't even have good corn, mm-hmm. good pigs, good Chicken. chickens. We're, we're just eating. Yeah, nothing. that's a good so. point that we have isolated and privileged and fetishized only the material causes. A thing only is what it is materially mm-hmm. in its materially constituent parts. So you can really mess with a thing before it stops being the thing if you're only <laughs> thinking about it yeah. materially. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, that's very clear. And it's interesting that given that emphasis, we can't stop ourselves from messing with them genetically. That's right. Because uh, with chickens, for example, we have stopped regarding them as a chicken. When you just think about the material cause, you and you kind of, maybe you sort of lie to yourself like you don't have a final cause, but you do. Uh And it is the max production of protein units to generate the maximum amount of legal tender. That's right. Yes. For a certain group. Right. And it's it's to make the chicken actually produce money, mm-hmm. not to feed people. Right. So that becomes the final cause. So that you buy and sell um, chicken houses. You know what I uh-huh. mean? It's not the simple thing. It's, it's speculation. It's not the simplicity of purchasing a chicken in exchange for money. Mm-hmm. It is buying and selling shares or chicken houses depending on how their value fluctuates, Mm -hmm. hopefully buying low and selling high. Stock prices. That Mm -hmm. becomes the value of the chicken, Mm -hmm. and it's most directly relative to the protein units produced. Mm -hmm. So now we have chickens, 
that cannot walk at about eight to 10 weeks. <laughs> we have so hybridized them that they have lost their ability to do chicken to do the chicken thing, to be chicken. They can't reproduce. Yeah. They can't live to uh, a reasonable age. They die as chicks because their mm. legs cease to work under the weight of their own breasts. Mm. And so they, they sit in their own excrement and burn their skin with the nitrogen from their own excrement. Mm. It's horrible and they mm. stink in their... So in all of our emphasis on the, the minutia focusing so intensely on the material, we have totally altered the bird. Because in the end, we do have our own final cause, our own purpose for the bird. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's almost like we're trading God's final cause to our own. Yeah, exactly. Our own means, our own ends. Yeah. Because then we change ourselves, too. We've, mm -hmm. we've so changed that bird that now we're, A, we're not eating healthy anymore. Mm -hmm. And got all these sicknesses and B we're also trying to make our own home meals efficient too so we're not actually gathering as a family anymore we're just stuffing protein blobs into our mouth right and because that's all chicken is anyway so mm. maybe that's all I am anyway yeah. and yeah the whole thing's upside down that's why I think <laughs> that the you know the nutritional facts on any label is mm -hmm. it's a grave insult to everyone yeah it's just yeah. it's so insulting yeah uh it's like here are the nutritional units that are contained herein mm -hmm. as if that's all that matters to the food that we mm -hmm. eat mm -hmm. as if those metrics are in any way even remotely objective or valuable for us to know they're mm -hmm. always relative to what some central planning supermind thinks we need to eat mm -hmm. Which is utterly yeah. insulting. I think it's it's bad. Yes. And it's gross. It doesn't taste good. I know. Yes. So Calories. As if we burn gasoline like cars. <laughs> Heat units. So when you were first talking about this book, you were actually... The thing that you were arriving at is what a city is. And maybe mm. we could break that down either now or another time. But... Um, it, the city, you were telling me the city doesn't actually produce anything. That's right. It merely centralizes and by extension controls. Yeah. So can you flesh that out for us a little bit or? I, mean, I can try. Okay. Because that's a, that's a, that itself is a big concept, I think, mm -hmm. to understanding why you don't want to be part of a city <laughs> <laughs> or at least as much as you can extract yeah. yourself from it. At least not, you know, let it sap all of your virtue because yeah. it will. Yeah. Um, but that was a big concept to me was, whoa, yeah. you're right. Like it's not actually like being creative. No. It's just consolidating. Yes. And he was even seeing that on the human level. Like, mm -hmm. With industrialization came the tenement houses, mm -hmm. and he has several chapters mm -hmm. based on how the dehumanizing this is. Mm -hmm. We're just stuffing bodies into the smallest amount mm -hmm. of space possible, which huh, I know all too well as a mother of eight children. If you put too many bodies in too small of space, mm -hmm. only vice can reign. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, well, it also makes anyway. you conveniently and absolutely dependent upon outside the city. So that is the great irony of the city, hmm. is that the city not only doesn't produce anything, mm -hmm. it is a leech yes. on the country, yeah. on agriculture. It produces nothing. It only consumes, only. But then it presumes to distribute all of the products of agriculture and eventually it destroys the agriculture also. Right. So I think you can live in a city. It just takes heroic virtue yeah. to actually live in a city um, and not fall prey to the illusion uh, that the city propagates. The idea that human life can, can exist like that and specifically have no cost, that you can be... Like that you could be an environmentalist and live in the city, mm. I think is actually a contradiction. <laughs> it's not. You are mm. a major toll, mm. you know. 
Um, and the city obfuscates the toll that your carcass, your body is yes. on reality, That's on the I'm natural order, on the management of your waste and on the sustenance of your body. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that is obfuscated. It is concealed from you. Yes. The packaging and the processing of the primary goods that we depend on, it, it disguises mm -hmm. what the process that, that that brought it that, there. Yeah, that brought it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we don't see all the layers and the levels of input when we receive a packaged good. Mm -hmm. We just think, oh, voila, it's mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we don't know how it got there. And then at worst, we actually start to feel entitled to it mm -hmm. because we don't realize the cost of it. The cost of it, right? Yeah. And then. That's how you get people just taking things off the shelf because it's like, oh, yeah. it's entitled. Yeah. And well, and that's, yeah, and then it gets to this weird idea that is made possible by that phenomenon that you just described, that food should be free or that energy yes. should be free. Yes. And you can only say that if you've never produced either. I mean, do mm. have you ever tried to grow fruit? <laughs> um, yeah. Immense amount of energy and time and resources is, is poured into it. So... It's free in the sense that it is the the passive po the potency is in the earth mm. for your intellect to work upon it and to grow these things mm -hmm. and that that is available to every human so I guess it's like it's possible for everyone to do it um, and maybe that's what people are getting at when they say that food should be free there's also a weird social like self love thing going on there but so flattery <laughs> but um it's compassionate to say that i know it's so yeah. weird it, it's like not to the person that produced it we're yeah we're all about charity but that's a different thing and yeah it go it cuts both ways too there's a really great concept that's brought out by father fahey which is that um the kind of the plight that we're describing mm -hmm. results from liberalism and communism they both end in the same thing mm -hmm. and by liberalism i mean like classical liberalism which historically would be the opposite side of the pendulum swing from communism ah right um and it, they actually end up in the same thing okay in the same end right which is the dominance of the city destruction of the land mm -hmm. and the centralized planning of all the things mm -hmm. um and it's really, once you see it, it's, it's very clear, mm -hmm. you know, communists have to do the centralized planning, uh, in order to bring about the utopia. So they tend to use government to do it. Whereas the liberals, they just print money and subject everything mm -hmm. to the value of currency, mm -hmm. uh, which was, gives you the same end, mm -hmm. the disjointing of all food production, all humanity from their final cause which is, of course, in God, but that just trickles down to the final cause of the corn to feed the family, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to read just a little paragraph yeah. here, and this is from Father Fahey, who is quoting um, Monsignor Leguti and Father Ra in Railroads to Security, which okay. I think is also a book that I have. Oh, um, Rural Roads. Rural Roads. Uh, to Security. Oh, okay. so I don't think he's actually... Quoting that, never mind. He's saying that's a good source on this okay. exact topic, but okay. I think the quote comes. Well, yeah, there's a next quote. He's he's confusing about his quotes. Alternative <laughs> to death by Earl of by the Earl of Portsmouth. Okay. Uh, but he says so. Both Wall Street, with its giant incorporated concentrations, and the government concentrations under commissars, which is communism, mm -hmm. move in parallel columns under similar management toward the common destructive objective, which is the totalitarian state. Yeah. So end quote, and now he's gonna make his own little commentary. Mm -hmm. That disordered and anti-natural state, however, with despotic power concentrated in the hands of a few and the country subordinated to the city cannot endure for quote, the desert has succeeded to the cities of the past because being cities, they bred a race which forgot the soil on which it fed. So cities create deserts, yeah. which you know, like, obviously, this is mm -hmm. of course true. Okay, mm -hmm. continuing with that quote, the background of human wisdom is the, the ever-present consciousness that the soil nourishes the plant, 
the plant, the animal, and plant and animal, the human being. So there's the divine plan for order that Father Fahey mentions. Continuing, thus the city is built from the produce of the soil. As soon as the soil is made, the servant of the city and not the master partner in civilization, the desert begins. Man, insofar as he is an animal, is bound to the soil. When he enters the city, he cuts himself off from one side of his own nature, and even his fertility fails. Whoa. So that he has to be constantly renewed from the country stock. Oh, right. <laughs> First, the soil is exhausted of its human stock and then of its own life-giving qualities. This is exactly what we see, right? What, like, all the farmers are over 65 right now, and it's they're like 0.001% of the population or some insane yeah. proportion. Like, yeah. this is a major crisis that there are no more farmers mm -hmm. happening right now, and the ones that we do have are very advanced in years. Mm -hmm. Okay, continuing to the last sentence. So, definitely exhausting the human stock. Mm -hmm. For many years, the human exhaustion can go on, but once the exhaustion of the soil's own stores of fertility sets in, the town gives way to the desert. So, What does that mean? That sounds like the apocalypse. <laughs> it is an apocalypse of the city. The yeah. city will waste. Yeah. It, 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 will, it will vanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it is all, um, it is all disordered. It's too top-heavy. Or yeah. something. Well, and it's it's because it's not it is divorced from its causes. Yeah. So it's it's the story of Babylon, a city which exists yes. for its own growth, for its mm -hmm. own its own advancement, mm -hmm. its own expansion. That's the only project that it has. Mm -hmm. um, and both Liberalism and communism contribute to that same end, mm -hmm. which we can see. And yeah. the, the, I, I think the most fundamental way to hash that out, to describe that, is what Father Fahey says, that we see, and I think it was actually one of the popes, too, that he got it from, the, the pendulum swings back and forth from the rights, valuing the rights of the individual over the rights of the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's liberalism. That also results in this top-down uh, disordered society because there's no cap on the kind of legal tender that the individual can generate at the expense of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And then it swings right back to the other end of the spectrum, <coughs> which is absolutely mm -hmm. valuing the rights and the dignity of the community over the individual, mm -hmm. which is where you get state-sponsored centralized planning and the same kind of totalitarianism. Yeah. And they both cannibalize themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they're not living for some, anything outside of themselves. Right. Yeah. Because they're divorced from the divine... <coughs> Excuse me. From the divine order. Yes. Yeah, so the thing that... <clears throat> the thing... The... Um, What's the term I'm looking for? The conclusion that Father McNabb has, and he states this in his first chapter. He says at the very beginning, we have placed this chapter at the beginning of the book because we could not place it also at the end. <laughs> Nevertheless, we wish our readers to place this chapter at the beginning and also at the end of their reading of the book. So his conclusion is like two and a half pages okay it's yeah. very very short and so good it's a great summation i almost want to read the whole thing but i'm not going to mm -hmm. um i'll give you a quote though but this is kind of the punchline of him and he takes the rest of the book to describe the decay and the putrefaction of the city and mm -hmm. just in the details like mm -hmm. in, just in case you haven't been you know convinced yet mm -hmm. it here's how but um but his conclusion is 
that there is more than just these material reasons to leave the city. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what you've brought up with um, Mr. McKnight and Mr. Holdsworth, that we have to leave the city or at least not be as dependent on it as right. as possible. Yeah. You know, we're all extracting ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're all moderns. We're all like just trying to do what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we don't leave the city because it's healthier or mm. um, it's a, a more calm, peaceful mm -hmm. way of life or even the entertainment and the leisure and the recreation outside the city is way better than what the city mm -hmm. has to offer. Like, or, or prepping, you know, like I've got to prep for the apocalypse. Like all these material reasons are good, but ultimately we leave the city um, from, this is his, his conclusion, mm -hmm. which was really helpful. Um, and it comes down to Jesus' words, seek ye therefore the first, the kingdom of God and mm -hmm. his justice and all these things shall be added unto you. And he says, no people has ever left the town for the land or re remained on the land when it could have gone to the town, except under the motive of religion. Um, because for this very reason, we need the outside purpose mm -hmm. motivating yeah. all of these things, building a good family, mm -hmm. ed good education, good medicine, good whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. all these natural motives. Ultimately, they will cannibalize themselves by either the communistic method or the liberal method mm -hmm. um, unless it's grounded in the proper worship of God. Mm -hmm. And then he and he uses the the story of Exodus. It's ultimately a story of Exodus. Yeah. To demonstrate that. Yeah, leaving the flesh pots of Egypt. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, if that seems like an imposition on like the you know the more real material strata of everyday life, that is a distinct uh, quality of our current modern philosophy. Is that the worship of God is ancillary or doesn't really affect things that it's actually just part of your private life, your private experience, and it doesn't affect things, but you cannot quantify. It's not even comparable to look at the changes that have happened in the past 250 years or so since all the, since God was pretty much excluded from the public, from the government through separate church and state from public life and relegated to the private realm, it is impossible to, to compare the changes that have occurred and the fragmentation since then relative to what went on before. And so it's actually like incredibly practical. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it is the most practical thing. Um, and it's only our distraction by the, which is common to everyone. I experience it all the time. By the, th by the material demands right in front of us that we forget that that is the most important thing. And you, you can see it echo in two ways. Like I, I feel like there is, when you understand things by the four causes, which also involves the assumption that you can, you can actually know those four causes through your senses for the most part. Right. All of that information can come through your senses. Yes. You can know the final cause, the material cause, the formal cause, and the efficient cause of a pig, which means mm. you know what it's for. You know how to raise it. You know how to feed it. You know how to slaughter it. You know how to cook it. You know how to cure it. Um, when you understand a thing in that order, because it's an order, which implies a hierarchy of values. And this is... What I love about him using uh, our Lord's uh, Sermon on the Mount when he says, Seek mm -hmm. ye first the kingdom of God and his justice. Mm -hmm. And justice is rendering to each what he is owed. Right. It's rendering what is owed. And which is a great order. It's an ordering. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like it actually, it, it goes all the way to the top. Because if each thing has a final cause, there has to be a final cause of the final causes, <laughs> which is 
uh, the love of God. It's mm. in God. Mm. And so you, you could map out the universe of things relative to their ordering to God in, in an intelligible, clear map mm. if, you believe, if, if you see things under the action of their four causes. Mm -hmm. And this is the medieval, I mean, this is the pre-modern mindset. Um, so you could look at, you know, corn, and you could say that's ordered towards the fattening of a goose, which is ordered towards the feeding of my family, mm -hmm. which is ordered towards their physical good, which is ordered towards the good of their soul, which is mm -hmm. attached to their body, um, or their body's their in their soul. And, yeah. their, and their intellect. That's right. Like the body even serves the intellect. Yes. Yeah. Which is, I mean, what's the good of the soul? But the beatific vision yeah. is to be with God. So you can literally track everything. So the raising of your corn, mm -hmm. the understanding of your corn, the growing of your corn has a an, you could, I guess it would be an indirect link, but it's a, a mediated link yeah. to the good of your soul. Right. Um, now, of course, grace comes in and builds on that nature. And without that, we can't get to the final cause of final causes. Mm -hmm. But um, in any case, you have that clear ordering. And you can see this in the Lord's Prayer, which, That's is, right. yeah. and which is actually a hierarchy of petitions. Mm. And St. Thomas even points out that they, they are ordered by importance. That's right. Mm -hmm. So at the very end, right, said libera no samalo, mm -hmm. you know, but deliver us from evil. Uh -huh. That's the most basic request. Yeah. Like, just deliver us from the evil. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let me get hit by lightning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or get a flu when yeah. it's really inconvenient. Or, right. Or a drought. Yeah right yes or a plague right but then we go well, you know what precedes a great evil and it's usually a temptation mm -hmm. lead us not into temptation because right. sin is actually a worse evil than mm -hmm. anything that could happen then in your fields right exactly yeah. then a disaster yeah yeah it's yeah. a worse evil yeah is uh so lead us not into temptation um and then you can go all the way up through the prayer in reverse mm -hmm. order uh-huh yeah. And it's actually kind of neat. You can see like, oh, it's good that we can pray to have like a good crop. Yeah. Because that's, that's not too, that's not, uh, not permitted. Too base. Like, yeah. Or, yeah. No, you yeah. go ahead and pray uh -huh, for that uh -huh. because you're not strong enough to uh -huh. handle too much suffering. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But then what you see as you go up, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth mm -hmm. as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Give us this day mm -hmm. our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. Mm -hmm. We forgive those who trespass against us. So yes. that is the phrase right before lead us not into temptation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so having committed the sin, mm -hmm. we, we will not be forgiven if we're not forgiving mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So the state of your soul, then, you know, we're, we're going up in value here. Right. And then what is the best for your soul but the quotidianum? Yes. The daily bread. Yes. Which is... The body and blood of the Lord. Right. It's, it's yeah. Holy communion. Yes, that's what that's referring to. Yeah. That's so many the good of these of your clauses blew my mind too. Yeah. By the way, just like th we're stumbling on this, you know, in our late thirties, and yeah. we're like, oh my goodness. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that. No, it's true. I just this news read to this us. section, I know. so it is yeah. news to me. Um, but that's your soul's good, and that happens at the mass, right? Yeah. And it's only really when you're animated and filled with. Uh, the life of God through communion that um, you can do his will yes. <laughs> on earth and in heaven. You can't do it. Uh -huh. And that's even because, more important. Because that's in the supernatural <laughs> realm is to, to actually have your will united mm -hmm. with the will of God. Mm -hmm. That's what charity is. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that's how you usher in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Like kingdom come. Mm -hmm. Thy will be done. Mm -hmm. And that's the next clause, mm -hmm. thy kingdom come, mm -hmm. the next petition. And that is building off of your Holy Communion at the Mass. Right? Yeah. Which sometimes it's. Which enables you to have yeah. charity. Right. This is, all, this is just the individual level. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then his, his kingdom will come. Mm -hmm. That's the plan for the kingdom. Yes. Not and, our social building. Right. And yeah. what is the point of bringing his kingdom? To bring glory to his name. Uh, hallowed be thy name. Right. 
His glory. So that's it. Mars. That's right. Yeah. That is actually the final cause of final causes. Mm -hmm. Hallowed be thy name. Yeah. The name of God. And, mm -hmm. and that is, so you can see that that's actually the ordering that of, orders everything of, of being yeah. it yeah. puts my state in life right in there like his will be done like mm -hmm. my god's will for me is to be a helper to you to raise all the children and educate them and um that's kind of it <laughs> which, which is a lot and to save your own soul yeah yes mm -hmm. that's right and going to daily mass I try my best, but if it gets in the way of my state in life, then I have to pull back, even though I really want to go to mass, yeah. you know? So it's like even spiritual goods, we have to be able to yield to his will because mm -hmm. doing his will is more important than my will. Yes. So you can see that in the order of the prayer itself. Right. Yes. Right. That whole, it just orders things because then I yeah. can go, okay, I want this. Where does it fall in this whole litany? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of low. Okay. Well, <laughs> maybe I'll give that one up or... Or if it's way high and like, okay, I think think this is yeah this is important to right. do. So, yeah, the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. It's a good it's one to, to meditate on. Yeah, so saints have just meditated on that prayer alone and yeah. become holy. So, yeah. Thank you again, Meatsmiths, for listening to our take on all things meat making, householding, and culture keeping. We hope it's helped you in growing your home around the harvest. This conversation will be continued in a forthcoming part two episode. Thanks for listening and peace be with you.